Banish the Snakes is a cooperative and solo game by GMT representing the expansion of Christianity in Ireland in the early Middle Ages. The player or players will control groups of saints, although technically I guess aspiring saints at the times of the events, and you will travel around the island uh, debating druids uh, and try to convert leaders and the local population. You have to remember this is a very vertical society so that if you convert the high king well the high king is likely to help you convert the the local kings the local kings have an influence on the chiefs and the chiefs have an influence on the population again it's all very vertical and we'll see what that means exactly and you're trying to again uh, basically you see this map this is the game at setup actually I'm gonna show the entire board first there you go. So uh, this is the board at setup. What you're trying to do is to change it entirely. Everything starts with the pagan side showing up. And so you can see uh, chiefs that are uh, blue blocks, local leaders, blue blocks sitting on uh, local kings, blue blocks sitting on brown uh, blocks, uh, the high king sitting on a purple block, and then the local population. And these things that you see here, those uh, orange cubes, orange, I don't know exactly, it's, you see what they are, uh, they represent druids. At the beginning they are face down because you don't know how powerful they are. Everything else is uh, double-sided, meaning uh, the population has a pagan side and a Christian side, which is generic. The leaders have a pagan side also, a pagan side also, and the Christian side is not generic, it has a different modifiers which is positive instead of being negative, and you just don't know until you convert them how, uh, how excited about Christianity they're going to be, so you don't know exactly how good of a positive modifier they're going to give you. And again, the druids are the, the toughest thing, the, the most dangerous thing here. Now, the game starts, each turn starts with uh, an event phase. And what, well, the active player or the active saint, again, you can play solo either with a single saint or with multiple saints. So at the beginning of the turn of the active saint, you will draw an event card from here. Now what is interesting is that there will be already a card next to the current card section with an arrow pointing to the current card section because that will tell you of the various sections of an event card which one will be activated. In this case we just look at the, at the blue section at the bottom because that's how it works. So actually this deck of events really has more events than you would imagine because again each card has multiple events and depending on what is there different events will be triggered. Now the first turn is kind of special, it always starts with Arthur there indicating what event is triggered. After that you will put it in the Scotland deck, we'll see later what that means, but first I want to give you the sense that when you draw events for the second turn, then that card will be there, it tells us which event is activated, which is the green one, and then goes in the discard pile, and this will be used to activate the next event. Now not every card is strictly an event, uh, some are, oh some will advance paganism, in Great Britain. There are uh, several decks which I mentioned earlier. We have a Scotland deck, an England deck, and a deck from a region that I cannot possibly pronounce. They will be triggered and you take these decks and you shuffle them to the main deck as paganism advances in, in England. So when the paganism advances event is triggered you will move down this marker and basically when it leaves an area, say leaves Scotland, then that has become pagan, you take these cards and you shuffle them in there. It's usually bad stuff, it is mostly invasions that will uh, undo your progress. And if paganism goes down enough, uh, then you have more cards added to the main deck. Incidentally, if it goes all the way down here, this is one of the things that will trigger 
the end of the game. When the end of the game is triggered, then you see how much Christianity you uh, were able to, to foster in England. So based on regions that are entirely Christian or partially Christian, number of chiefs that are Christian, number of churches that you have there. Then you score points and you see how well you did. You also end the game if you convert every 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 population in England, uh, unlikely, um, or if you're, if you're if enough of your saints die and you don't have enough replacements, because again, if you're a saint or aspiring one, it's not always bad to die. You may give uh, an advantage to the cause. But that's for the event for the event phase. Now, as I said, not every card is necessarily an event, but again, I want to show you how the chain of events works. Not every card is necessarily an event. Some, for example, are keeper cards that will go next to your personal display. And this, for example, when you get a your helper. So you have a main saint, and when you draw one of these cards as a as a, as a keeper card, you keep it next to your display. Let me show you that. But you don't use it yet. When your main saint, when your active saint, I should say, is uh, is dead, then the keeper card becomes the new saint. So each saint in the game will have a display, such as this one, showing you several important pieces of information. Well, first, uh, there are multiple possible saints and they have unique abilities and special powers. So Saint Brandon, for example, travels very fast. Other people are good at building churches or converting leaders or talking to the people, etc, etc, etc. And here under that uh, your main display, that's where you keep your keeper your keeper cards. If Brandon was killed, uh, we would put a, a grave in the place where it is, and then maybe later that can be looted and turned into a relic. And uh, if we have a saint that becomes in the keeper section, then that saint becomes the new active leader. Otherwise, you flip the board to the other side uh, if you don't have any replacements, and that represents an acolyte. If again, you don't have enough saints <laughs> and you don't have enough acolytes, that's another way in which the game may end. The saint display also shows us how much zeal you have. Zeal is the number of actions that you receive each turn. When you lose, and you start with four, when you lose zeal, then you have fewer actions. If my zeal is there at the beginning of my turn, I only get three action points that turn. If I have two, that's really not good. If I am that little zeal, however, that's when I can make a final effort, which means will give me a temporary advantage, also is the last thing that the saint does before being turned into a martyr and being turned into a grave, and again, hopefully we get a replacement there. So zeal tells us how many action points we have, and then we use this at the display to actually uh, keep track of that as we spend actions. And uh, during the game, uh, very often you will attempt the convert action and you will use this other uh, slider here to keep track of the modifiers because really manipulating these modifiers is the heart of the game. Suppose I'm trying to pass a test uh, that has a difficulty of minus six, but I got three modifiers that go that way and one modifier that goes the other way. Then uh, when I roll a die, when I take the action of trying to convert somebody, convert somebody with that difficulty, I will roll a die. If I roll higher than that, the conversion attempt was successful. If I roll exactly the same, it failed, but there's no negative effect. If I rolled less than that, then not only have I failed and wasted my action, but yeah, I also lose a zeal. That's one of the ways in which you can lose zeal. Another way is through events. So. Remember the events I showed you earlier. Then after the event phase, it's time for the active, for the active saint to take actions. And again, trying to uh, to change somebody's mind is the is the heart of the game. So we're gonna do that a lot. The difficulty on the slider is based on the modifier of the chief or population you're trying to. Uh, to bring to Catholicism, to Christianity, but uh, as modified by a lot of other factors. However, we said there are those droids. Uh, those droids are 
tough and they're also unscrutable. If there is an unrevealed druid in a region, you cannot convert anybody. Their influence is infinite. I don't think that you so you can spend an action to try to uh, to debate a druid. You can also spend action just to give yourself modifiers and before going in against a druid, that's a usually good idea. Suppose, for example, I decide to spend two actions simply to give myself a modifier of two. Then I flip the druid there. Now the difficulty is three. So just to show you what would happen on the display. I spent two actions to prepare my modifiers, one action to debate the druid. The druid, if you remember, has a difficulty of minus three. So first I place the slide, my difficulty there. Remember I had bought two modifiers, so I slide it that way. And now I roll a die. So that's a good situation because in the worst case scenario I fail but I don't lose zeal and anything above one will allow me to remove the druid. The druids are not really converted, they just disappear. Emptying, freeing that space, it says druid church and you may want to fill up that as quickly as possible because if a druid church space is empty, there are effects that will allow the druids to sneak back in. So for an action point, I can build a church. I can build a church up to one step per turn, meaning that that is a church level zero. If in a later turn I spend an action there, I can turn it into a church level one. In a later turn, I can turn into a church level two and yes it takes a while to get to a cathedral because you can only build up churches by one by one level per turn. However churches once they're there they'll also give you a positive modifier. Another thing again we're talking about a very vertical uh, society in which the druids they don't care much about what society thinks about them. Everybody else does. So if I'm trying, for example, to convert a king here, and right now the start difficulty will be minus three, I also need to take into account the influence of the high king. The king responds to the high king. And right now the high king has minus two. So if I was to attempt converting this guy right now, we'll start with minus five. Plus other modifiers such as churches, for example, I have a church of level two that gives me a plus two. Again, the droid would be a negative thing. If a saint had died there earlier and there's a grave there, that would give me a plus one. If I converted that grave into a relic, there is a variable modifier. Also, the relics can be can be carried around because, you know, looting the graves of your masters and bringing around the body parts seems to be super effective. So you got to take all of those modifiers into account. The modifiers that come from the region and they come from basically the step right ahead. The high king only influences the kings, the kings only the chiefs, etc, etc, etc. So suppose that I successfully converted that chief, I turned it that way. Now if I were to try to convert that one, that would be a pretty good situation because I have a difficulty starting of minus four. But I got plus two from this one, plus one from that one, and this guy listens to that guy. So I will get a plus two there, which I think will give me an automatic success. I only need to spend the action. And then when it comes to the population, well, you place them in order from your flock, from lowest, uh, from lowest difficulty on the, on the left and the highest on the right. And you start converting them also until hopefully they all convert and then you move to the next area and you start again. So your main action again will be to, um, so you spend actions basically to uh, prepare your conversions, basically and you bank them to turn into modifiers, actually attempt conversions, moving typically from one area to the next, carrying around the relic if you have one and you decide to do so building a church or increasing a church but again if you go to an area with the druid you really gotta address that you can also if you're playing with multiple saints uh, you can also give or take keeper cards you can turn a grave into a relic and that's pretty much the general idea again it's about increasing your chances of converting people 
converting people within a very strict social hierarchy and try to convert as many people as possible and again just get ready get ready to respond to invasions because part of your progress will be undone that's just how the game works Banish the Snakes is a game that I played only solitaire and I liked it that way. I don't think I need to play with other people. Then I'm afraid that the downtime may be a little too intense. And sure, if you play with multiple Saints, uh, they can trade cards. But say it's not as organic as, as in Pandemic, for example. It's not that there are ways or reasons to cooperate that will make that synergy constant. Most of the times, probably, you want to spread out and try to convert different areas. So, I'm just afraid that multiplayer solo will add to the downtime and the quarterbacking without necessarily adding to the, to the dynamic element of the game. But again, solo, no problem whatsoever. Sure, setting up the first game, you gotta place all of those stickers on those blocks, will take a little while more than just, you know, punching cardboard tokens. But then you have a game that really looks impressive on the board. And honest, I like the thickness of those blocks because actually it really visualizes that some people are higher, literally higher on higher seats than, uh, than, than other people. Um, and then, of course, uh, it's just fun to, when, you, when you randomize, when you remove people from the board or chiefs, uh, leaders, because the invasions, then you put them back in the pool and you're going to randomize them. And it's nice to dig in those wooden blocks and draw new ones. So, I like the amount of agency that you have when it comes to, to the, the strategy uh, and the ratio between that uh, and, and the randomness of the events. Now, something that can be a little controversial is the fact that, again, in the later phases of the game, there are invasions that will take away your progress. Modern game design has tried to steer away from that uh, because, you know, taking in, into account the fact that we have loss aversion, that losing what we got uh, is more annoying than to gain the very same thing. So it's an irrational thing, but it's how our feelings are connected uh, in our brain. And if you think about it, for example, in Pandemic, of course you're going to have an AI that takes away your progress, because if you remove cubes and the AI puts them back, probably numerically, mathematically, it's very similar to I put a church or I convert a number of people and the, and the game removes them. And yet, to see and to feel that what you did was removed, in Pandemic, again, your progress is removed, but it feels more abstract. Here it can feel a little more... Uh, well, your morale may take a hit, I would say. But then you realize from the second time that you played that that's the nature of the beast, that's how it's done. And then you, you play and take that into account. You know that if you build a certain church in a certain a a a section that hasn't been raided yet, uh, it's probably not going to make it until the end of the game. It may not make it. So maybe you get a church there that gives you the bonuses that you need, but you don't invest in building a cathedral there because it will score you points at the end of the game if it stayed there and it's not likely. And you realize that certain areas are more dangerous than others. Now, an interesting thing is that that hierarchy of how things influence each other they do that that does tend to lead the action towards certain paths that are just more mathematically preferable to others. And as I read the rule book and I realized that that was going to be the case, I thought that that was going to make the game super trivial and boring. So I'm actually pleasantly surprised and I'm happy to report to you that this may be one of the most exciting railroaded games that I play. Because for some reason, yes, if I can convince the High King before I go to the King, and then I can convince the King before I go to the Chiefs, and then I can convince the Chief before I go to the population, that's preferable. And yet, and yet there are a lot of other interesting little things that happen. For example, um, random Chiefs coming and going, random events modifying things, uh, the abilities of the, the abilities of my Saints giving me different things. So, I felt that I was able to create different strategies and still plan my turns significantly uh, around that script, which is, no doubt, very rigid. And again, I really like the fact that 
there is an element of randomness mitigated by how many things you can do and your powers and your special things. So it's a nice tension there. So Banish the Snakes, definitely a game on an original topic. I hadn't played a game on this topic before. And I think the execution is very nice because the core engine is super simple, uh, but there are a lot of interesting things that you can do. I think I, I like how it reproduces the society of the time. To me, it's an added value if a game has an historical flavor. And it, this game does that while at the same time remaining very easy to play, very simple to play, not necessarily easy to play effectively. Winning is not necessarily easy. Banish the Snakes. I'm going to recommend it especially as a Soiter game. If you play it uh, multiplayer, let me know if downtime was a problem for you. But again, I'm happy with the game in the Soiter mode for now.